Now we should be clear as we talk about this subject of assurance that the prophets foretold an effective salvation. <coughs> the picture that is depicted today, I'm afraid, does not project that conclusion. I find that all too often Christians are explaining why they sin. There really isn't an ex acceptable explanation for sinning. Salvation was a remedy, an effective remedy, as well as a provision. So a person has to think of salvation this way. It not only is a provision bringing you something, it's a remedy for a condition. An effective remedy for a condition. Now, when John the Baptist was sent into the world as a harbinger or forerunner of Jesus Christ, he brought something to the people they didn't have before. Zechariah, in his marvelous prophecy, said this about. John, Luke 1, 76 and 77. Thou, child, shalt be called a prophet of the highest, for thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation unto his people by the remission of their sins. Now that bears a lot on our subject tonight, to give knowledge of salvation by the remission of their sins. Assurance has to do with that. that assurance is an amplification of the knowledge of salvation by the remission of sins or through the facility of being made righteous to put it another way. So I want to address that subject with tonight with this in mind, that the prophets foretold an effective salvation. John the Baptist came to introduce the idea of an effective salvation that would do something. And that right, that assurance is an amplification of that of that knowledge. You see, Israel was brought out of Egypt successfully, but it didn't have the intended effect upon them. Or the work of righteousness didn't happen, as Brother Judah introduced us to that. Righteousness wasn't the effect of it, even though it was a genuine deliverance. And they were delivered from the Babylonian captivity, the Judah was, and it didn't have this effect either. But the prophets leaked out this piece of information that in the economy of the Redeemer and in the salvation of Christ, it would have this effect there would be the assurance that was so lacking before the before that era. So this text in Isaiah 32, 17, the work of righteousness shall be peace and the effect of righteousness, quietness and assurance forever. The prophets longed to see something like that, but they never did in this world. They never did. Now this text, Isaiah 32, is a messianic text. So this, this is dealing with what, what we're experiencing in Christ Jesus. And I want to take just a moment to give the different translations or different versions of this text. Several, several versions refer to the service of righteousness. 
the new revised standard version said it's the result of righteousness. The basic Bible English says it's the effect of an upright rule to be taken to be to take away fear forever. So in that one here, the righteous would be Christ's righteousness. The English Revised Version says the effect of righteousness will be confidence. The Revised Standard Version says the effect of righteousness will be trust. The Septuagint Version says the righteous shall be confident. The New American Bible says the right, right will produce calm and security. I'm reading these because this is a large statement that's been made and so the people had a difficult time to translate over to English because it's such a big, big thought. Young's literal translation says the service of the righteousness keeping quiet and confidence unto the age, we'd say throughout life. Living Bible says quietness and confidence will reign forevermore. The Amplified Bible said the result of righteousness will be quietness and confident trust forever. See, remember our text said the effect of righteousness, quietness, and assurance forever. Yes, that's, that's our text. And the Good News Bible says because everyone will do what is right, there will be peace and security forever. <laughs> so <laughs> it's quite a large statement that's made. So you have the pictures there of a righteous one creating assurance, which would be Christ. You have living righteously results in assurance, which is valid also. You have the idea of, of peace and security of a reign. That, that this assurance is like a, it just isn't like something that's present in the mix of life. It's a dominating type thing that rules over the whole life assurance it determines how a person thinks and what a person does and how they respond see it's a big we're talking about a big word here Amen. now as I said this text is a messianic text which is driven Christ is the engine of this text here you take Jesus out of this text and it just collapses it doesn't have any power for instance Verse 1 of the text tells us that a king shall reign in righteousness. Behold, a king shall reign in righteousness. And princes, that's the, depicting the ones under him, the believers, shall rule in judgment. Now this is a prophetic announcement of salvation. This, I want again to reaffirm that this is not the picture that is being presented today. The church is not presenting this picture of a reign in righteousness. There's all kind of chicanery and dishonesty and pilfering and, and all kind of things like this going on within the people that the prophets said would follow a king who's reigning in righteousness. <coughs> and his princes rule in judgment. And you've got to have assurance to judge. Assurance is part of judging. It's a critical part of it. Again, the second verse, I'm establishing this is a messianic text, or this is a salvation text, if you want to talk about it that way. Second verse says, A man shall be for a hiding place from the wind and a covert from the tempest as rivers of water in a dry place in the shadow of a great rock in a weary land. That's the kind of salvation this is now. This is a salvation where a person can hide from the wind so that the wind doesn't tear them apart, so the wind doesn't destroy them. This is salvation. This is a, this is a covert that covers you up so the tempest doesn't damage you, so you're not dislodged by the storm. So there's raging. Storms are raging. We won't deny that, that the tempest is raging. We don't deny that. But this salvation that the prophet says is going to come to pass, this is the salvation in Christ Jesus will provide a protection that the person will not be moved by trial. 
And it's just the salvation we're talking about. If this isn't the salvation that's being depicted, then what's being depicted isn't salvation. Amen. Now there'll be a dramatic change in the people. This text tells us, verse three: the eyes of them that see not shall be dim; the eyes of them that see shall not be dim, and the ears of them that hear shall hearken. So that's going to be characteristic now of the salvation of this Messiah. The people are going to know what's going on; they'll see. And if they didn't see before, they're, they're not going to be in that condition on. Their vision will not dim. Uh -huh. Yet nature sometimes vision dims with age. It's not going to dim. I'm not in the regime of the Messiah. It's not going to dim. Amen. Amen. So if it's dim, if things are getting dark and hard to understand and confusing, if that's what's ensuing, then somewhere Jesus has been left back there someplace. Amen. And the ears will hearken. That is, the person will respond to what they hear. When the Savior speaks, there will be a response. Moses said, that's the kind of prophet God's going to raise up. He's going to raise up a prophet that you'll hear him. You'll, you'll hear, not hear him like a hear a sound going on. You'll discern what he's saying. And whoever doesn't listen to this prophet to this, is going to be destroyed from among the people. See, Moses announced that way ahead of time. <laughs> So you see there's going to be a savior who's a ruler. There's going to be a hiding place for safety. There's going to be a change take place. The, both the heart and the tongue will be healed. It says I, verse 4, the heart also of the rash shall understand knowledge and the tongue of the stammerers shall be ready to speak plainly. Yeah. Well, this is a marvelous thing to, Amen. Amen. to see. This assurance is in this context now. So if there is an assurance, then some, some, some of this stuff has been missing. That's right. so, some of this hasn't happened because the prophets prophesied the truth. Mm -hmm. They right. prophesied the grace is going to come to us. They spoke precisely about it. And if they said that people are going to be assured, that's exactly what they meant, that they'd have assurance that the result... The, the result of a, of a righteousness was going to be assurance forever. And during this rule, the wicked are going to be known for who they really are. Uh -huh. There's not going to be confusion about them. Yeah, amen. This is verse 5 through 14. We'll take the time to read this. <laughs> the vile person shall no more be called liberals. You're not misinterpret. You're not going to be misinterpreted to people. And the churl said to be bountiful. People are going to be noted for what they really are. For the vile person will speak villainy in his heart, will work iniquity, in to practice hypocrisy, and to utter error against the Lord, and to make empty the soul of the hungry, and he will cause the drink of the thirsty to fail. It's, he's going to do that during the reign of this Messiah. Yeah. Uh -huh. So this Messiah is going to bring great satisfaction and assurance to the people that trust him, but to others he will cause the iniquity to surface, and you'll see the wicked for who they really are. The instruments also of the churl are evil. He deviseth wicked devices to destroy the poor with lying words, even when the needy speaketh right. But the liberals deviseth liberal things, and the liberal things shall he stand. Rise up, ye women that are at ease. Hear my voice, ye careless daughters, give ear to my speech. Many days and years shall be ye be troubled, be ye careless women, for the vintage shall fail, the gathering shall not come. But what he's saying is, people that have loafed their way through life, like what Paul calls silly women, all of a sudden things are going to fall apart. And their life isn't going to work. And all of their plans are going to fail. And what the real cause of it is, another king has risen up that doesn't honor those kind of activities. See, that's what he's saying. Tremble, you women that are at ease. Ye be troubled, ye careless ones. Strip you and make you bare and gird sad cloak upon your loins. They shall lament for the teats, for the pleasant fields, for the fruitful vine. Upon the land of my people shall come up thorns and briars. Yea, all you all 
upon all the houses of joy in a joyous city, because the palaces shall be forsaken, the multitude of the city shall be left, the forts and towers shall be for dens forever, a joy of the wild ass and a pasture of flocks. So you wonder why, why did he throw in that lengthy explanation? Because whoever adheres to this king, none of this stuff makes any difference to them anymore. The fabricated life <laughs> will, that will be evident that it's, it's not satisfactory at all. And, it, and so the person will abandon it. See, that's what's going to happen now on the day of salvation. It's over, you find people who say they're saved who are clinging to this, to the bad stuff. Whoever the saviors come to, it's not to them. Yes. And it, we can't be mistaken about this. Yes. This is not the kind of life Jesus produces. Yes. Jesus does not just prolong the life of un, unruly people. This is, this is not what this is going to do. And assurance cannot be had by people like this. Yes. Now something else is going to happen, that the, what was formerly a wilderness would become a fruitful field. This is verse 15, until the spirit, see, until. That is this condition of the, of the wicked, this will continue to prevail until. Until the spirit be poured out upon us from on high and the wilderness be a fruitful field, and the fruitful field be gone for a forest. That is to say, when this king starts to rule, all this other loses its attraction and it becomes offensive to the person who's under the king. Be quiet because you cannot pay attention to the churl and the vile person and villainy and have assurance that this can't happen. Yeah. If you live close to the world, you cannot have assurance. Yeah. People may talk about assurance. We need all can have assurance. We all can know, but we can't all know if we're living close to the world. Amen. That's the point of this prophecy here, that there was going to be a significant change. Assurance evidences change because we this is assurance in the presence of God Almighty we're talking about we're not talking about just having a self-confidence that's that's not what we're talking about we're talking about when a person is faced with God they know they're faced with God they're assured yeah. this is our Lord we have waited for him and judgment and righteousness then will do their work judgment shall dwell in the wilderness that was once barren, and righteousness remained in the fruitful field. Now this is the context in which this righteous, this assurance is mentioned, that there, Christ has arisen, he's inducted a new era, in which the people that follow him are not dominated by sin. And with the people that follow him see the error of the wicked. They can pick up on it and they know what it is. And it's offensive to them. And the effect is assurance forever. <laughs> Quietness and assurance forever. Now there's a <coughs> parallel verse to this in Isaiah 30 and verse 15. Thus saith the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, in returning in rest ye shall be saved. In quietness and in confidence shall be your strength. And ye would not. That's what Isaiah told him. Quietness and confidence are almost identical to the language we have. That's where your strength is. As soon as your assurance begins to wane, your strength begins to dissipate. As soon as you don't have the knowledge of salvation, you become keenly aware of your shortcomings. Is this the way it works? Your prayers become less effective and probably less frequent also. <laughs> Righteousness, see, a law, a law mentality rejects what God offers. Here's what he said once again. In returning and rest shall ye be saved. Come back to me. Stop running on the broad road. Come back to me and you'll be assured. 
and you'll be strong because you'll be confident, quiet and confident. But you would not. Yeah. Why? That's the kind of attitude law produces. Yeah. It moves people. It'll bring you to Christ if you pay attention to it. I understand that. But that's not what he's talking about here. He's talking about these people just got tired of hearing about their faults. Just got tired of hearing about them. And when God offered rest, the price was too great. We were kind of like, we kind of like this corn that Balaam's given us. We, we kind of are satisfied with the waters that Egypt has loaned to us. We, we don't want this. We don't want what you have to offer. Listen, God is still offering this sort of thing. Return to me now. If you've wandered, like, just stop tonight. Like, stop! Stop! Amen. Stop wandering and come back. And rest. Stop the turmoil. Let the waters, let your, your hearts like a troubled sea. So let, let it calm down in the presence of God. <laughs> it's good and pleasant to be in His presence. Yes, amen. You know that. And what will happen is that assurance will start to surface. And life will not be as intimidating as it was before. And, and the thought that you're going to fail will not be as dominant yeah. as it was before. Because this is the kind of king we've got. This is the kind of reign he exercises, you see. You find when, when any of the disciples were with Jesus, they, they never were, while they were with him, were for, afraid of the scribes and Pharisees and Sadducees and the lawyers. They never did tremble. They never said, Lord, what are they going to do? We're kind of afraid, Lord. Are you going to protect us? They never talked like that. They had quietness <laughs> and assurance. And even people that came to Jesus who, were, who had great difficulties, sometimes their children were on the verge of death. Uh, but they seemed to calm down when they got near Christ. See, that, that's because that's the kind of rule he exercises. You get to kind of get under his wings and quietness and assurance surface. But law, a law mentality rejects this. It, see, it seems too simplistic. It says there's got to be something else to it. But righteousness, <laughs> it reacts differently. <coughs> the work and the effect <coughs> both of righteousness shall be assurance why because righteousness is real Amen. even though righteousness is imputed to us that does not mean it's not real righteousness Some, sometimes I get the idea that people think because righteousness is imputed it's, it's not real now here's Romans 4.23 225 says of Abraham it was written for his, it was not written for his sake alone that it righteousness was imputed to him but for us also to whom it shall be imputed if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead who was delivered for our offenses and raised for our justification <coughs> so the right the righteousness that produces Assurance is very real righteousness and is given by Christ. It's not something you produce. Yeah. Amen. Living right is something you do, but it's not something you caused. Uh -huh. It's God that caused it. He, the righteousness he gave you was like a new motor. <laughs> uh -huh. it, it drives your life. It's very real. And, it, and the more you are convinced that God has made you righteous, the more assurance begins to yes, amen. dominate. See, your assurance isn't, well, I've, I've went a pretty good length of time now without doing this or that. Yeah. Yeah. That's not the thing that produces assurance. I've, I used to lose my temper a couple times a day, and I'm down just about every other day. That's not what does it. Right. It's righteousness that does it. And we were made righteous, Romans 5.19 says. That's the righteousness that has the effect of assurance. It's that righteousness. It's not an invisible righteousness or 
a pretentious righteousness or an imaginary righteousness is real righteousness. It really, it really causes a person to hate sin and love righteousness. It, it causes a person to flee from sin and flee to Christ. It, it's that kind of righteousness. It's very real. Amen. You probably have found, like, as I have found, that a great number of professing Christians do not have the slightest idea what it means to be righteous. They think it's in terms of what you don't do. This is how they think now. But the righteousness of God isn't it just in terms of what you don't do. It's what you do do. Yeah, that's right. That is the primary thing and that's what in other words it throws your effort it causes you to throw your effort into doing good and pleasing God and that's what reduces sin not an effort to try and stop it. Even though, the, even though you do, I admit, have to expend effort to stop it, it's your efforts, not what does it. It's your righteousness that does it. Yeah. Amen. We are made righteous. Now, <laughs> as a result of being made righteous, we are justified. Being justified by faith, we have peace with God. That peace with God translates into assurance. See, that's what it becomes. When you have peace with God, that's what causes assurance, confidence to arise. Because you now, you feel comfortable in the presence of God. In fact, you'll do anything to be in the presence of God. You, you'd rather spend a day in the house of God than a thousand someplace else. You're satisfied with his house. You're, you're glad when they say to you, let's go to the house of the Lord. And that condition is what causes assurance yeah. to surface. Assurance is the proof of your justification. Yeah. And we're not saying you are justified or aren't justified. That's not ours to say. But when you're assured, you have this assurance, you know, you know your identity with God. You know that he's for you and not against you. You know that this thing's going to turn out to your salvation. See, and this is growing on you, see. It's growing on you, know this. Now, now you stop for a moment and say, now let's look at this equation. Now, I've looked at the bottom line. i got this assurance now. Now I'm able to stand in the face of iniquity. I'm able to resist the devil. It, well, this means I've been justified. Yes. This is your proof that you've been justified. And the intended condition is to be a permanent one. Effective righteousness shall be quietness and assurance forever. See, it's intended to be a, it's not intended to be sporadic, on and off. Today you have it, tomorrow you don't. It equa Let's say it another way. Quietness and confidence, quietness and assurance forever. Let's say it another way. Everlasting consolation and good hope. Yes, I say it's the same thing. And what is its effective righteousness? These Thessalonians. They received the word of God in much assurance. See, what does that mean? They, they received in much assurance. It caused, pers it caused persecution. They, they, they received it. Much, a lot of contention went on there, and they suffered because they received it. Yet they received it in much assurance. Well, it was much assurance because they saw God in it. They saw what God was doing in it. They saw that God was for them and not against them. They saw that God had raised them and just condemned them. They saw that God had, saw that God accepted them rather than rejecting them. And then what happened is they were so assured they could just stand in the midst of persecution, just stand tall in the midst of persecution because they were assured. Amen. Why do people cave in to persecution and pressure and this? Why do they cave in? It's because they're not assured. Yeah. They don't have assurance. They don't know their identity with God through Christ. They haven't been convinced of it. Even though God's told them about it, the prophets told them it's going to happen. Jesus said, come unto me now. Just come to me. I'll give you rest. And learn in me and you'll find rest yeah. under your soul. So it's, it's everywhere taught. But you... Christ has to become central before this, yes. all of this can happen. You cannot be kept or be assured without giving due attention to this confidence and assurance. 
Hebrews 10.35 says it this way, Cast not away, therefore, your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. Don't. Just because a storm's arisen, remember there's a, there's a man that's for a shadow of a mighty rock. He's a covert in the time of storm. God provided a place for wind, so in the wind of adversity rises, don't, don't be crumbling. There's a place, there's a place. You get inside this covert, and you'll be assured. It'll go well for me. God's going to work things all together for my good. See, that you'll be assured of that. And the trouble won't dislodge you. But you have to give attention to it. This is when you came in. This is the way you felt. That's right. Amen. You just like felt invincible. You, you were so, you were, you were kind of spiritually naive. You were stunned that some people didn't want what you had. Yeah. You tried to share it, you know, and they didn't, you couldn't understand. Why, why don't they want this? I thought for sure they'd be glad when I told them. Uh -huh. What was it? You were in the rock. Yes. <laughs> See, you were in the hiding place. You had assurance. And you were, and you got to maintain that. All through life, maintain that. What if my approach to religion normalizes sin? Yeah. What if all of a sudden I buy in to a concept that makes sin, we're all sinners. We sin, all sin all the time. Yeah. This is just the way we are. And say you buy into that. Yeah. Even though the prophet said, no, 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 that's, that's not going to be that way anymore. It's not going to be that way. You're, You'll have the knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of sin, not the committing of sin. Now people think that when they commit sin, that then's when they can really tap into grace. So that's, that's wrong thinking. Amen. You tap into grace by faith, and the sin you have to throw the faith overboard. Uh -huh. Christ is the son over his own house, whose hearts are we. If we hold fast... The confidence and rejoice of the hope firm unto the end. That's confidence and rejoice of the hope. That's a, a breakdown of assurance. That's, that's having a microscopic view of assurance. That's what that is. Your assurance isn't, I'll not have trouble. Your assurance is there isn't anything that can separate me from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus my Lord. I know that now. I know that now. I spent some time in the covert. I spent some time under the shadow of a mighty rock. And I've learned by experience now, God, God keep me safe. Yes. I'm convinced of that now. Now you got to keep that assurance. Yes, amen. And Satan's going to try and take it from you. Amen. He's going to try and make you think you're not in. Mm -hmm. Of course, the only way he can really do that is to draw you to things that allow for that type of, uh -huh. type of thinking. But Christ is over this house. You just stay in the house. Now stay in the house. If you just stay in the house, your confidence, even though it may be knocked down right now, it'll pretty soon it'll get up. Yeah. If, and if your assurance, if you once had assurance, but now it's kind of owing to trials and difficulties and things that are very dis disappointing things, and they happen, and your assurance kind of growing weak, stay in the house. I'll stay in the house. Yeah. And if you stay in the house, pretty soon assurance will. Muscles will re be renewed and it'll, it'll rise to the surface again. Huh? And you won't have to go all your life lamenting that you denied Jesus three times in one night. Yes, amen. You'll be able to put it behind you. Amen. Huh? <laughs> amen. That's assurance. See, that's what assurance does. Assurance has an amazing recuperative mm -hmm. powers. Yes. But it all depends on staying with the king who's a reigning in righteousness. It, it all depends on staying with him. So when there's something that begins to lure you out away from Christ, you resist that. Consequences be hanged. Even though you may lose some friends and this, that doesn't make any difference. Here's what it says in Hebrews 3.14, we're made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence, there's that assurance, steadfast to the end. Yes. Don't let anything shake your confidence. Amen. Now, before the night probably is over, something will try and do it. Uh -huh. Sometimes you may get some 
news from some place and it'll kind of shake your assurance and confidence. You say, I don't know whether I'm going to be able to hold on. Stay in the house. Yeah. Stay in the house. Stay under, the, stay in the covert. Stay behind the rock. Provision and salvation has been made for you to have an ongoing assurance, quietness, and confidence forever. Amen. Not to run out. Mm -hmm. Well, this is so uh, practical. Now, I'm not. I'm not naive about life. I know that a person can be jarred and shaken and think they're <coughs> going to lose their faith. That can happen. Because there are things that happen you can't you can't control it. You, so because you can't control it, maybe you think you're weak. See, but your God doesn't bring you into control. Reign in life doesn't mean you control life. That's not what it means. It doesn't mean that you're able to stop the things that hurt and make to cease things that agitate. That's not what it means. It means you stay in the house. And Jesus fights your battles. Yeah. And you've got to believe that he'll do this. Mm -hmm. That he'll come to your aid. Because he's a savior. He's not a condemner. Amen. Right. He's a savior. So that's, that's what he does. He saves people. That's what he does. But, but he only saves them if they stick with him. Yes. And he that believes on him will not be disappointed. Mm -hmm. He will not be. So the effect of righteousness will be quietness, <laughs> peace, 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 be still. Jesus said to your heart, be, right. be still. If you just have ears to hear, he'll say that to you. You'll be troubled. Like, well, there's things that trouble me. A person is emotional like I am. I'm an emotional person. So some things can really trouble you. A lot of things can trouble you, you know. But sometimes I can almost hear Jesus say, peace, be still now. Give my servants some rest so his assurance can wake up, <laughs> be robust and strong. And I commit you to look at assurance not as a mere thought <coughs> or a perspective, but as part and parcel of the newness of life. It's part of the life you have in Christ Jesus. It belongs to you. It's yours, but you, you do have to possess it. Mm -hmm. you, have to, you have to step into the house, stay in there. You have to get into the covert. You have to get behind the rock. You have to get where the storm can't get. Yes. See, what it amounts to is in salvation, God provides a place of safety that the moral and spiritual storms can't get in there. The best they can do is agitate your flesh, so to speak, the natural part. That's the best they can do. But they can't get in to the safety zone. And assurance is birthed in the safety yes. zone. Amen. The more assurance you have, the more stable you'll be. Amen. And the more stable you are, the more productive you'll be. Amen. This is the manner of the kingdom. Yes. Brother Robert has our exhortation.